the things that you have to do to run a remote company are like the same things you have to do to run an in-person company. Um, the difference is you often need to introduce structure and process and formality just earlier in the company's life. Um, I actually think this sets us up for more success over the long run though, because when we get to 500 people, we've already got the processes and playbook in place. It helps us scale much faster. Being a remote company multiple times, I want to get into that uh, now. You know, so we have a superhero oath, right? You know, the principles and values that we live by here, right? Mm -hmm. So, what are some? I know being remote is one of those for you guys. Yeah. Uh, can you talk more about more about that and how that has helped you throughout your journey, as well as maybe some yeah. other business principles that have worked out really well for you guys? Yeah. So, uh, in the early days when we were first making those first hires in 2012, uh, we had to sit down and think, like, um, you know, what, what are the kind of like what are the values of the company? What do we care about? Um, the exercise that we did um, was we sat down amongst the three founders and one of our earliest employees and asked ourselves, what, uh, what, what does it take to be successful at Zapier? And I think that at Zapier part is the really important part of that question. Um, you know, at, at this point, we'd been running for uh, a year or so, so we kind of had some idea of like what it meant. What, what would set you up for to have more success working with us as a founding team? Um, we asked that question, we wrote down a whole bunch of ideas, we kind of curated it back, and uh, it turns out that a lot of the values that we wrote down um, kind of follow from being a remote company. Uh, our number one value is default action. We really value folks who are capable, are able to and have the kind of um, intrinsic ability to like see a problem and then go take action on it without having to go build consensus or make a, you know, uh, or get blocked in trying to think how do I actually get this thing done or, or or hesitate. Like we really valued folks who saw a problem in the early days and would go just run as far as they could and take ownership of that problem. You kind of have to do this as a remote company because you don't. You're not sitting over. You know, you're not sitting over someone's shoulder all day monitoring their work and making sure that they're on task for eight hours a day. You kind of have to trust that like they're doing the right thing from their home office or wherever they're working from. Um, so that value felt it tied in very strongly there. Um, and we would screen for that then when we were hiring for finding past examples of folks who had like uh, who had defaulted action when they were faced with problems and didn't didn't hesitate and didn't get blocked by uh, by like organizational factors or, or something else. Uh, the second value we have is default to transparency. Um, again, this follows from a remote company. Uh, you know, how do you default to action if you don't know what everyone's working on? How do I how do you default to action if you don't know what's important for the company? So it's after you're like we have all of our you know internal metrics are all public, all of our goal tracking we use uh, OKRs, which is uh, objectives and key results. All of those are public across the entire organization. Um, everyone at Zapier writes like a Friday update every week, which is basically a, a, a status report, a memo on like what you worked on and what you're planning on working on and things you've learned or decisions you've made. Um, so uh, Zapier is a, a very, very transparent company. I think it's important, it's needed and required it to run a basically a fully distributed team. Uh, things would grind to a halt if, if we didn't. Uh, asynchronous communication wouldn't work if without having like a strong uh, value of transparency in, in place there. Um, the other value that we, we kind of flushed out over time as well, but uh, yeah, I think a lot of them followed from, again, just asking what, what, do, we, what do we think is success? Uh, what, or what does it take to be successful at Zapier? And um, a lot of them fell out again of kind of asking, yeah, what is, what, what's the kind of, kind of company we want to work at? This is a remote company. There's a lot of individual autonomy. What does it take to be autonomous? Um, what, what does it look like uh, in practice? Um, and you know, those are the things we share with every new employee who starts. Uh, they don't guarantee you'll be successful at Zapier, but they certainly give you a big leg up. Uh, is how we think about it. Uh, a lot of the founders here are just starting to build their teams. So, if uh, what, what advice would you give uh, for the founders that are starting to build teams that want to maybe uh, either consider remote or want to definitely do remote? Like, I know you guys did the Airbnb thing for the first week and then <laughs> the the month. And so, yeah. uh, what what are some what are and, and then do you guys use dashboards? Like, what what, what infrastructure needs to be there in order for that uh, remote team to be successful? Um, yeah, great question. Um, What infrastructure for a team for onboarding? Um, I mean, the reality is in the early days, you don't have anything. Like, you're going to be flying by the seat of your pants. You're going to be creating a Google Doc with, like, just notes that you share with the person. <laughs> uh, your, your expectations that you set are not going to be very clear. It's going to be like, I think there's a problem over here. I need you to go, like, figure it out and solve it. Um, that's kind of the reality of the situation. I think as you, as you mature, you can then start trying to do a better job of, like, Putting more process and things in place around it. Um, you know, one, one of the one of the funny things about running a remote company, um, I, I kind of get asked a lot around like, 
uh, how, how is running a remote company different than running an in-person company? Or how does, how does onboarding differ? How does you know, management differ? And the truth is, it's actually not. They're, the things that you have to do to run a remote company are like the same things you have to do to run an in-person company. Um, the difference is you often need to introduce structure and process and formality just earlier in the company's life. Um, I actually think this sets us up for more success over the long run, though, because when we get to 500 people, we've already got the processes and playbook in place and the decision-making frameworks and the clear expectations and the leadership and the titles and the comp bands. Like, all of that stuff is fleshed out, and it helps us scale much faster and more efficiently than, than another company might be in our, in our shoes. Um, so, you know, thinking back to the early days, again, like, what are the types of things we need to do for onboarding? It's not different for remote. It was the same thing that you probably do, would do if you were in person, which is, like, I'm going to probably invite the person out to spend a bunch of time with them. I'm going to sit next to their laptop. I'm going to, like, handhold them to get their, like, development environment set up or, you know, uh, whatever expectations I'm going to set. Um, yeah, I think there's one, the one big key thing that we did learn uh, running a remote company that maybe this is slightly unique to remote is... Uh, or maybe not not obvious um, from the outside is despite being 100% remote, uh, uh, I, th I think there is a lot of value in getting in person um, from time to time. We run two company retreats every year where we fly everybody in the entire company into a single location. To, how, uh, how many people now at this time. point? What's that? How many people at this point now? Uh, we started doing retreats when we were seven people. Um, so very, very early on. Um, uh, and early on, you mentioned the Airbnb onboarding. We had a similar philosophy in the early days where we thought it was very important to like, get people to, uh, to hang out with us for a week, primarily to build trust. Um, you know, I, I think trust is one of those like, most important th aspects of any kind of team you're building. Like, you want to be able to trust that the person's going to be consistent, repeatable, and how they execute and how they think. Um, it's just a lot faster to build that trust in, uh, in, if you can do it in person. The other thing you get advantage of from being in person is you get higher bandwidth. Uh, so remote companies like have a bunch of different modes of communication that you can go through. Um, if you think about like uh, a bandwidth spectrum, at one end you get uh, uh, in person, right? I can use my body language, I can use nonverbal communication. Um, you have all these like subtle cues that come only when you're in person with somebody. If you think about the other opposite extreme of that spectrum, it's no one's talking at all, right? Uh, and in person companies kind of default to this in person mode where uh, I get the highest amount of bandwidth. Um, I can ramp up all the way. I can use you know, all those cues I just uh, mentioned. Um, but it's 100% interruptive, right? If I go tap you on the shoulder, I have your complete attention. You cannot, you, you're completely like, focused on me now. I've interrupted whatever you're working on. Remote companies on the hand, they, there's no communication by default, uh, but everyone's 100% focused on like, whatever they're working on. So you get that efficiency from focus. And the challenge of remote companies is figuring out, okay, what, what mode of communication do we need to be in for these different like, activities that we do? And realizing that in-person is going to start from uh, you know, this high bandwidth but high interruptivity, and remote starts from this low bandwidth or no bandwidth, uh, zero interruptivity, and you have to like, kind of work your way to the middle depending on um, you know, what, what the job to be done is. So you know, in the case of uh, a good example of something we run into is like in Slack, I'm sure you all use Slack, you see like the many people are typing a little message that sometimes shows up if there's like three or four people in the one channel typing. So for us, that's like a cue that, hey, you should like raise the bandwidth. You should go from, t you know, text chat, which is closer to this like, you know, extreme end of not communicating at all, to jump on a video call together. And you could probably bang out this decision that you need to make in, you know, 10 minutes on a call as opposed to wasting, you know, a full hour just t t texting back and forth in, in a team chat tool. Um, Similarly, in an office, like, you see people use, like, the headphones or whatever as their social cue to, like, <laughs> try to lower their interruptivity. Um, so we have, we've developed those similar types of social cues uh, uh, within the company to figure out how do, we, how do you increase the bandwidth when you need to. Um, and uh, onboarding and uh, retreats are kind of one of those intentional decisions where uh, we realize, hey, by default, we're not going to be together ever. Uh, we all work from different states, from different countries. Um, but there's a lot of value in building trust. There's a lot of value in... Um, uh, building uh, network connections across the company that no normally wouldn't happen, um, those can happen much easier and faster if we get people into the same physical location occasionally. Um, so that was kind of, uh, you know, it's another, if you want to think about it, it's another, uh, it's another hack on our communication modes to uh, uh, help us accomplish something that was important that we thought for the company. Great. And so how, how many total employees do you have now? Uh, we're over 250 now. Okay. Yeah. From how many, how many different countries? What's that? How many different countries? Um, I think we're in like 25 countries now wow. all over the world in about 30 U.S. states. That's incredible. Wow.